so today we're going to um, be talking more about antibodies that we started on uh, Friday. And we have our nice trusty antibody here. Um, and I told you at the end of class on Friday that we have this problem that people often think of antibodies as being sort of superheroes um, and being able to do all sorts of amazing functions to get rid of microbes, and yet they're just a protein with four protein chains. <laughs> um, and so what we wonder is, how is it that, that, that this antibody, when it binds to a virus or bacteria, as in these comics, and if you like the comics, that's where they're from, a site called Pedronics. Um, how is it that just having a protein bound like this actually does something to those microbes? And so today we're going to be talking through those details of antibody functions. Um, so again, here is our antibody, as we saw it last time. You can see our two identical heavy chains. Um, those two heavy chains are held together by two disulfide bonds in the middle, as you see here. We've also got our two identical light chains that are each held on with a disulfide bond here. Um, we talked about the um, FAB that is able to bind antigen, as well as the FC region. And the FC region is, in fact, a big part of what we're going to be caring about today because the FC region is really how our antibody is actually able to um, do its function. Your textbook nicely shows six different functions of antibodies um, that allow antibodies to have some effect on pathogens. And we're going to work through those six. They're all labeled here, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, although I'm not going to go quite in the order that they're listed here because you already know some of them. And so I want to highlight the fact that you actually already know two of the six antibody effector functions before we even made it to this part of the course. Um, so where have we seen antibodies already in this course? UK? Yeah, so they were involved in a cascade with the innate immune system. What was that cascade? Complement. So we saw antibodies um, initiating the complement cascade. And in fact, one of our six functions of antibodies is to fix complement and to start that complement cascade that we already talked about with the innate immune system. So you don't have to do any you know, learning here. You already got one of the six down. The second one you haven't seen before in the context of antibodies, but you have, in fact, seen it before in a different context. Um, so when we talked about complement, I told you that complement has the ability sometimes to do opsonization, to opsonize. And it turns out that antibodies can opsonize too. So if you remember, opsonizing is the Greek for making tasty. It's where we coat our microbe with something in order to make it more likely to be phagocytosed. Um, I told you it was like butter, and on my original uh, immunology exam I took as an undergrad, I defined it as butter. Got it wrong. Um, so opsonization is the second of our antibody functions. Again, pretty straightforward because it's the same basic opsonization that we had before. One thing that you should realize um, is that when I told you about opsonization with complement before, I mentioned the fact that we have receptors that are complement receptors. And that in order to make that opsonization process happen, we had to have a complement receptor binding to our complement fragment to induce phagocytosis. Again, in this opsonization process, we have to have a receptor that is binding to our um, antibody to allow for phagocytosis. Here, it's not going to be a complement receptor because it's not binding complement. Instead, it's binding the FC portion of an antibody. So if you were in charge of immunology and you wanted to name this receptor, what might you name it? Marina would name it an FC receptor. And Marina would be correct. <laughs> um, so in fact, um, 
This is a place where we have an FC receptor, which binds to the FC portion of an antibody to allow for phagocytosis. This is not the only function that can happen downstream of FC receptors. So you'll see that some of our antibody effector functions um, involve FC receptors. Others do not. Um, there are different FC receptors that can be involved in different processes that we're going to see. Sometimes they have names like FC gamma receptor. The FC gamma receptor binds to IgG, the gamma type uh, constant region. The FC alpha receptor binds to IgA. The FC epsilon receptor binds to IgE. Um, and they can lead to different things. We will see some of those different functions as we go today. Um, but opsonization is the first of our effector functions that really requires um, that FC receptor. So we've got two antibody effector functions that are pretty straightforward because they're stuff you already know. The third one is actually, to me, also really straightforward. Um, but that might be because I spend a lot of time thinking about viruses. And it's the one people talk about with viruses. It's the one that virologists care the most about. And so to me, it's the, the important, big, obvious one because it's the one I spend most of my time thinking of. Um, this function of antibodies is called neutralization. And so very frequently, when a virologist does an experiment to look for antibodies that are made in a certain response, they might not look for any old antibodies. They might do an experiment to look specifically for neutralizing antibodies, which would be antibodies that can perform the function of neutralization. Um, so this figure uh, depicts neutralization. First, we can look at the scenario that's happening on the left. Here we see a virus. Um, they, they're going to say it's influenza. Uh, binding to its receptor on a cell that allows the virus into the cell, um, allows genome release and virus replication, and the person gets severely sick. Why they have to be twins, I don't know. <laughs> um, however, if there are neutralizing antibodies present, which is the case on the right, those antibodies are able to bind to the pathogen, frequently a virus, and in fact inhibit that virus from e being able to interact with its receptor so that the virus is no longer able to get into cells and cannot perform uh, the rest of that infection. Um, and so in some ways you can think of neutralization as being fancy steric hindrance. <laughs> It's simply an idea where the antibodies are physically blocking the virus from being able to interact with its receptor. That's pretty important for viruses because viruses have to get into cells to be able to infect. So if we can just physically block them from getting into cells, we're done. Um, you can see another example of this here. This is rhinovirus, one of the uh, causative agents of the common cold. You can see rhinovirus uses these blue proteins in order to bind to this pink cell receptor and get in. And antibodies um, are shown here in green, tend to bind to those blue proteins so that um, the virus is blocked from being able to interact with the receptor. This could be binding to the exact same site of the protein that the receptor binds to. Or it could be binding to a nearby spot that just blocks um, interaction between the virus and its receptor. Either of those is fine as long as there's sort of a physical blockade. Um, so this is why I love neutralizing antibodies. There's one other way that we can think about neutralization with antibodies. In some situations, a pathogen itself doesn't cause problems. But the pathogen may make a toxin that can cause you damage. So some microbes make toxins. And the toxins cause all the, de the defect. If somehow you just didn't have the toxin, you had the bacteria sitting around, you'd be just fine. Um, antibodies also can serve to neutralize toxins. So typically, a toxin might bind to some cell surface receptor 
get into a cell and have a negative effect on the cell. Antibodies could also neutralize that toxin to keep the toxin out of the cell. If you remember last week, I told you about the von Behring and Kitasato experiments. Um, and I told you that they used Clostridium botulinum, Clostridium tetani, and Cornubacterium diphtheriae, um, three different microorganisms. And in their experiments, they this showed that serum transfer was important. They showed the importance of antibodies. And I told you there was a piece of luck with all of that. It turns out that all three of those microorganisms act by toxin um, and cause a lot of disease by toxin. And so in fact, in those experiments, they were seeing toxin neutralization um, with their antibodies. Um, though obviously they didn't know that at the time. So neutralization is our third big antibody function, simply a physical block between uh, the pathogen and its receptor, or the toxin and its receptor, blocking activity. The fourth one is a little bit lame, in my opinion. Fourth one is, is one, sometimes students look at me and they're like, this is the dumbest thing I ever heard. I, but I'm going to tell you why it's actually useful in a second. Um, the, the, this one can have a couple of different names um, depending on the way the experiment is set up. Um, officially, it can be called the formation of antigen antibody complexes. Um, sometimes, and this will come up a little bit more when we talk about techniques, we can also call this. Um, either agglutination or precipitation. Um, so the basic idea here is that if we have um, sort of suitable amounts of antibody and antigen, we can get these large order complexes made of antigen and antibody that may pull the antigen out of solution. It may induce clumping, or it may pull it out of solution. Um, and your textbook has this really nice figure where it shows um, bacteria. I think it was salmonella, but I don't remember exactly. The bacteria was in red. Um, GI tract cells are shown here with the blue and the green. Um, you can see sort of how those bacteria are um, dispersed throughout the GI tract. And if there are antibodies present, we can see this large scale complex formation where we don't have distribution of those bacteria anymore. They're now all clumped together. Um, you can imagine that clumping to be really important for um, sort of pulling the antigen out of solution, for potentially blocking it from moving forward. Um, you can also imagine. Um, however, some, you might also look at me and you might say, but yeah, why does making clumps of stuff help you? Shouldn't this like block your blood vessels and start block leading to blockades? Um, and in fact, if there are actually some situations where antigen antibody complexes can be pathologic and can cause you some problems if you just have clumps of stuff in the middle of your capillaries, it's actually not a great thing. Um, but many of those antigen antibody complexes can be cleared up really easily by phagocytosis. So officially, this um, type of antibody effector function is just the formation of the large scale complexes. But those complexes can be cleared um, pretty easily. Uh, and I'll, you'll see another example of some of them getting cleared later on. You might imagine, for example, with this cluster in your GI tract, it can be pretty easy for you know, the movement of your GI contents to just push that whole cluster out, um, removing it. So that one's pretty straightforward. Um, the next one, you're going to not like. And then later on, you're going to really like. Um, and the reason why is that the next one, I'm going to give you some information, but there's going to be some information missing as well. And so you're going to be like, but, 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 I don't get it. 
And then later in the semester, when I come back and give you this that little piece of information, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, this is so easy. I love this so much. <laughs> Um, so right now, I get it that there's going to be a little bit of confusion. Um, but the other type, or the fifth of our antibody effector functions, um, is known as something that's on the next slide, actually, um, ADCC, or antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. In this case, there is a cell that has the antigen of interest. Here it is shown in the top with this cell with the little red dots, which are called CD20. Apparently, this figure is trying to put together like ADCC and cancer immunology. Don't get stressed with that. Right now, it's just a cell. <laughs> you don't care. <laughs> Here, um, we've also got a cell with pink dots that are our antigen. So there's a cell that's the antigen, or that has the antigen. Antibodies bind to it, and then this antigen-containing cell is killed by NK cells. So cellular, because the antigen is on a cell, and cytotoxicity, because we're going to kill that cell. Um, specifically, we're going to kill it using a natural killer cell. So when Another definition of ADCC, a fancy way of, or a simple way of describing what happens in ADCC is that we're activating NK cells. And so as you can see here, NK cells will have an FC receptor. They can bind to the FC portions of the antibody after it has bound to our cell. And that NK cell can lead to the apoptosis of our target cell that has the antigen. So that's ADCC, um, and that's another way that antibodies can lead to um, destruction of some sort of problematic cell. Yeah, Nadia? What's the benefit of this over the other? So that's a great question. Um, one possibility is because this is killing perhaps a tumor cell. Um, the way that I might think about it also happening pretty often is one situation where you will have a lot of antigen on the surface of a cell is if that cell is infected by a virus. If the, we, you know, the, we missed out on neutralizing the virus, the virus is inside the cell, now the only option we have is to kill that virus-infected cell before it makes new um, viral progeny. And so this can be very useful in killing something like a virus-infected cell, whereas perhaps complement might be useful for getting rid of an extracellular bacterium. So it's really about what exact type of pathogen we see. Yep, Emilio. Wouldn't the injection of pyroptosis be better than uh, apoptosis in this case if the cell uh, has a viral infection? Why not signal the cells to enter an antiviral state? So, so that's a great question. Emilio says, why might this happen as opposed to pyroptosis? Um, I'm not sure that I can give you a full answer to that, but what I can tell you is that there are viruses that are able to inhibit pyroptosis, that are able to inhibit interferons. And so we need many different overlapping layers of defense. You know, having just one process that's going to work to get rid of our microbe is probably not going to be enough, um, we need, both because A, we really have to be sure that microbe is gone, and B, because many microbes are able to inhibit different types of responses. Um, and many viruses that turned on certain NK responses are pretty good uh, at inhibiting stuff. Um, the final, if you understand this one, then you should be able to understand the sixth function of antibodies pretty easily. Um, because here, we're not going to activate an NK cell, but we are going to activate a different kind of cell. And we're going to activate it through an FC receptor. Um, let me go back and show you one other thing on the NK cell slide that I want to be sure to contrast. Um, notice here that um, we see the antibodies binding to the target cell first, and then the NK cell coming in later in order to kill. Um, that is in contrast 
with how we often think of things happening in this situation with the activation of mast cells. It doesn't have to be. The activation of mast cells can also happen in that order. But sort of the classic way we think about mast cell activation is in uh, reverse, um, where we have mast cells that are covered with FC receptors. Those mast cells are able to bind to antibodies. And should the antigen ever come around, like, for example, this helminth, this worm, then the mast cell will, be, uh, will degranulate and release its granule components. And you can see a resting mast cell versus a degranulated mast cell here, where we've lost a lot of the mast cell components. I get a little cranky with figures like figure 12.5 because the mast cell components should be shooting at the helminth instead of in the other direction. That's the way it really works. I understand for art purposes why that's easier to draw, but really the components are directionally secreted at the helminth. <laughs> um, you can see that there is a lot of secretion of those components. Um, this could be important because that helminth worm could be really big and difficult to phagocytose. And so basically we're shooting toxic products at it to hope that we can kill it. This is also what happens in the case of your um, allergy responses. So basically, I am allergic to you know, all types of pollen that there is. Um, and so we might imagine that I currently have mast cells in my body that have antibodies already bound to FC receptors. And should I come in contact with that pollen immediately, we're going to bind to the um, antibody that's going to trigger the mast cell. My mast cell is going to release. It's almost like the mast cells are like getting fake pollen receptors. <laughs> they have FC receptors, and that's helping them to pull those anti uh, antibodies. Yep. That's traditionally the way we talk about it with mast cells. In theory, it could go either way with mast cells, but traditionally, this is how we talk about it when we think about mast cells. It's sort of hard. It would be hard for me to, you know, go into you, pull out your mast cells, and start actually looking to see the order in which it happens. <laughs> um, but that is traditionally the way we think about it with mast cells. So those are the six different functions that antibodies are able to do. The functions of the antibodies are related to the FC portion of the antibody. And thus, we also need to talk specifically about how those functions relate to the different antibody isotypes that um, we mentioned before. And um, I will just uh, warn you, because I've had this you know, I've taught this class enough times. Um, antibodies with different FC portions are called isotypes. Isotopes means radioactivity. Um, so we've got IgM, IgD, IgG, IgE, and IgA um, that are encoded by the mu, delta, gamma, uh, epsilon, or alpha constant regions, or MDs give everyone apples. <sighs> Here's the slide. Um, I apologize in advance to those of you who understand a lot of molecular biology and biochemistry. I am going to tell you about some observations that were made about antibodies. I am not going to explain right now how these processes work. That may give some of you fits. I promise you there is a way, there is an explanation, and we're going to get to how this happens. So right now, I want you to just say, OK, this happens, even if it feels like I'm telling you something crazy right now. So when people actually looked at antibodies that were recovered from people making responses, they noticed a couple of things. And they were able to describe two different processes that seem to happen to antibodies over time. We now know this must be related to a process happening to the B cell, because B cells make antibodies. Um, one of those processes is something called affinity maturation. So you probably know the word affinity. It tells you something about binding strength. 
and you understand what maturation is, um, what we notice is that over time, during an immune response, the antibodies that bind to a particular microbe early in the response do not bind as strongly as the ones at the end. So as the response goes on, the binding affinity of the antibody improves. It matures through a process known as affinity maturation. This is going to be important as we start to think about some issues with diversity that we're going to see coming up in the future. The other thing that was observed was that we can have the same antibody with the exact same binding specificity that binds to the same antigen with different FC portions of different isotypes. So in fact, we see this process of class switch where we can, for example, have an antibody binding to flu that at the beginning of the response, we tend to see a lot of IgMs in response to flu or pink bacterium. Whereas at the end, we see a switch and we see largely production of IgG um, in response to this. What this might tell you is that those different isotypes might do something different. You wouldn't necessarily imagine there would be a reason for a switch if they're all completely equivalent. And in fact, each of our different isotopes, wow, isotypes, even I messed it up, each of our different isotypes um, have slightly different functions and have some slightly different sort of, we'll say pros and cons to them. And so for the rest of the time today, we're going to focus on the individual isotypes and the unique aspects of them. What you will see is that some of those isotypes are better or worse at the six functions I told you about. And so those six functions are kind of going to go with different isotypes as we go through. Um, so this is a table from your textbook uh, about um, the isotypes. And, um, I apologize that I'm going to go sort of out of order for a second. Um, one thing to notice on the previous discussion of the different functions. In some places, I cropped a piece of figure 12-5 um, for the slide. Figure 12-5 was a really interesting figure that showed all the things that can happen because of FC receptors. Um, and so it was this really cool, like, what can FC receptors do? What functions are different from FC receptors figure? Um, it didn't make sense for me to present it quite that way now. But as you're studying and you want to think about similarities and differences between the different effector functions, whether or not they involve an FC receptor would be a good similarity or difference to think about. And figure 12-5 from your textbook covers that quite nicely. But now, back to isotopes. <laughs> Um, so we've got um, our different isotypes. We're going to talk through each of them today. Um, and we're going to look at some of the unique features of them. The first isotype that we want to talk about is IgM. And you can see I've highlighted the information about IgM here. If you look at IgM and the information that is highlighted, what do you notice stands out about IgM? What is, where is IgM really unique compared to the others? Yeah, Jordan. It's heavy. If you look at the molecular weight of all of them, IgM stands way out in that it's showing here a molecular weight of 900,000 Daltons, while most of the others are about 150,000 Daltons. So it's way bigger. Um, what about, how is it in terms of things like serum levels or half-lives? 
Yeah, Manny. Or short half-life. It has a decently short half-life, but it's sort of medium. <laughs> it's sort of medium serum level. It's not crazy high, not crazy low. Um, there are some that really stand out either way. Um, one thing that is not, well, that is actually listed here, but not in a way that would make sense to you right now, is that IgM is actually the first type of antibody made during a response. Um, it is present on, and where it says here, present on membrane of mature, naive B cells. That means, is it made on early B cells? <laughs> And the answer is yes. So IgM is made first. So in fact, IgM generally has not undergone affinity maturation. So it's going to have relatively weak affinity because it's made first. And some of the facts that we've just seen are a bit related. We noted that IgM is really big. The reason why IgM is really big is that IgM is typically found as a pentamer. So in fact, you have five IgM molecules together along with a chain called the J chain that joins them all together, making a pentamer of IgM. And so instead of having two binding sites for antigen, IgM has 10 binding sites for antigen. So the fact that it has weak affinity, that it has not yet undergone affinity maturation, doesn't matter because it's got 10 binding sites. <laughs> so those 10 binding sites help have really, really good affinity. This structure of IgM also really allows it to um, do it one fu uh, function really, really well. Because we've got 10 FAB arms that allow us to bind to antigen 10 times, we also have five FC tails. IgM can bind in this nice staple form you see here with a very specific geometry onto the surface of cells. And that geometry is just perfect to bind C1. And so, in fact, IgM is the best at fixing complement because it is able to bind with FC tails in a configuration that C1 really likes to bind. Yes, other isotypes can do that, but it's harder because they aren't already in this nice pentamer that C1 likes to bind. They sort of have to just happen to bind in the right kind of geometry. IgM always has that geometry. And so IgM is the star at fixing complement. The next um, of the isotypes that we have is IgE. No, I, I would love to go in the order of MDs give everyone apples, um, but there's a reason why this order makes more sense. Um, so if you look at IgE, does anything stand out to you? Yeah, Molly? It has a really short half-life. And it, it's actually the half-life's not as short as the... Oh, sorry, no, that's fine. What is it? Serum. serum levels. It has a super low serum level. Super low serum level. There's a reason why it has a super low serum level. It's because it hangs out somewhere that's not serum. It spends a lot of time as somewhere, somewhere other than in serum. The place where it hangs out? On your mast cells. <laughs> um, so in fact, mast cells specifically have an FC epsilon receptor, an FC receptor that binds IgE, and they're coated with IgE giving you a low free serum level of IgE. And so IgE is binding to mast cells and is really responsible for um, your allergy and your response to parasites. And so um, when we get to the spring and I'm suffering greatly from pollen, I will you know, curse IgE specifically because it's the one that's causing all of these issues.
So because now that we've talked about IgE, we can move on to IgD. So here's IgD. Um, if you look at IgD size-wise, does it look, how does it look? Average. If we look at it um, in terms of serum level or half-life, how does it look? It's, on, it's low serum level, um, medium to low half-life, kind of meh. Um, it is found on the surface of B cells during development. And you can see that here. Um, but I want to show you this table from the previous version of your textbook. Because when I think about IgD, I actually think about the old view of IgD. Then we can talk about the new view of IgD. So this is the old view of IgD. What do you notice about the old view of IgD? I see some, here's some snickering, so I think you figured it out. What do you see? Yeah, Emilio. It doesn't do anything. <laughs> um, IgD was all, I have always known as I, IgD as the one with no known function. <laughs> it's found um, on certain B cells during development, but it doesn't really do anything else. <laughs> it just is there, maybe an evolutionary relic. Um, it's not present at very high levels, but maybe that's because it doesn't do anything, so why do you need it? Um, we are now starting to understand that IgD may be really important, in particular for basophil degranulation, maybe a little bit on mast cells, but largely basophils. If you think back to our lab, where we looked at cells of the immune system under the microscope, what do you remember about basophils? Yes, Molly. They were really hard to find. Why were they hard to find? What? They're not very common. There were like none of them. And so in fact, because there are so few basophils in any, or in any uh, vertebrate that we're studying, it's really hard to study basophils. And so that was why this function was probably not understood for a very long time. And there's really still like five papers about it. It's still really, really poorly understood because it's so hard to work with basophils because there are so few of them. So it does seem as though IgD may have this role in basophil degranulation, um, but that function is not particularly well understood. Um, to the best of our knowledge, that function looks very similar to what we just saw with activation of mast cells and IgE. Um, so that's three of them. That's M, D, and E. We just have A and G left. So this is IgA. Um, you will notice that officially there are two IgAs, IgA1 and IgA2. Um, I'm not really going to distinguish between them too much, so you don't really need to worry about those differences. I've got them both highlighted here. Um, but if you look at the data first, sort of the numeric data on the top, what do you notice about IgA? What is that, Marina? Big range of molecular weight. Sometimes it's small, sometimes it's big, molecular weight-wise. It's sort of meh, serum level, meh, half-life. Um, maybe a little low on the serum level, which we can talk about in a second. Um, the size thing is because IgA also is not frequently found by itself. You frequently find IgA in dimers of two IgA molecules joined together by a J chain. Um, this, is, this molecule is known as dimeric IgA. It's also frequently known as secretory IgA. One other thing to note about IgA is that it is really different from other isotypes because it has this ability to have mucosal transport. 
as you'll see on the next couple of slides, it's in a different anatomic location than many of, many of the other isotypes. This is partially due to that J chain. This type of IgA can be secreted. Thus, it is called secretory IgA. This IgA can be produced in the blood, as all antibodies might be, but it can then bind to a special receptor that allows it to be brought in to a vesicle and brought across a cell layer into a secretory area. So for example, this might be the blood, this might be the intestinal wall, and this is the inside of the intestine where the food is. Or this might be the respiratory tract where the air is, and we're, go we're bringing the IgA across. We can see this in saliva. We can see this in lots of respiratory secretions. Sometimes we can see this in genital secretions. We can see this sometimes in tears. We can see this in a lot of different secretions where IgA has been carried across these cell layers. Um, and so IgA's really important function is in neutralizing microbes or even um, precipitating those microbes in mucosal areas. So this is sort of a first line of defense. In some ways, IgA can be related to like a barrier function <laughs> because IgA is out across the barriers. <laughs> they are able to potentially bind to microbes like this streptococcus that's shown here um, and have it be swept out of the GI tract, or I guess this is the respiratory tract, um, whereas otherwise that bacteria would be able to adhere and lead to some type of um, infection. And so IgA is not terribly special in terms of its function. It neutralizes. It can do most functions okay. But it's special because of where it is, that it's doing its job to protect you in your mucosal sites. You can see this here. So IgA is found in the locations that are shown in yellow in this person. And so you can see we've got in the eye, we've got in the respiratory tract, we've got in the, um, the GI tract, we've got IgA in a fair number of locations. IgA is also secreted into breast milk and is the one isotype that is transmitted to the baby via breastfeeding. Um, and so um, if an infant is breastfed, it will be getting IgA that, uh, from its mom. Um, there is one other super interesting fact about IgA. There is a disease called selective IgA deficiency. Um, this is actually the most common immunodeficiency. You can see the numbers of individuals with selective IgA deficiency on the left. And so this is the number of people per million who have selective IgA deficiency. So you can see that it's particularly high in the Saudi Arabian population, relatively low in the Japanese population. Um, but this is a really high number for an immunodeficiency. These people are completely missing IgA. Um, we think that these individuals are completely healthy and have no problems. Um, that may be due to the hygienic environment that we currently have. Um, you could imagine, perhaps, in the past, that having not been the case. Um, there is some epidemiological evidence that there might be some issues with chronic lung disease um, in some people with this uh, immunodeficiency, which sort of makes sense if there's maybe something going on with air pollution and air quality there. It's not really clear. There may be some epidemiological links to celiac disease, although again, it's not really clear. Um, sometimes people wonder, well, okay, so not having IgA, you seem okay you know, now with modern hygiene, but why was it that back in the day, all the people who had this mutation didn't die, didn't get eliminated, and we didn't have selection for it a long time ago when there was not good hygiene. And one thing that's important to think about is that um, IgA is transmitted to infants via breastfeeding. And so very young kids 
have IgA even if they can't make it themselves because they're all getting it from their moms. And so if a kid has IgA deficiency, they're probably not going to suffer much when they're really little because they're going to get IgA from their mom. Only when they're a little older and perhaps have some other protective mechanisms in place is that lack of IgA going to cause them any problems themselves. So yeah, you can imagine if mom had IgA deficiency, then that could be a whole other story. Um, but perhaps there hasn't been selection against this trait because of that transfer of IgA during breastfeeding. Um, so our, our final isotype is IgG. Um, so if we look at IgG, what types of things can you notice about IgG? Yes, Jordan. There's four of them. So there are four different subtypes. In fact, there are actually more than four because like two has like two A and two B. Um, so there's multiple different types of um, IgG. Um, since we mentioned that first, I will just go on to this and then go back to the other thing. So here are um, the four big IgG subtypes. What you'll notice is that they largely vary in terms of things like the hinge region. And so they can vary a lot in terms of their flexibility, but also in terms of how easy it is to proteolize them, to get them cleaved. You can imagine IgG3 with that big open hinge like that could be really easy to get cleaved by proteolysis, unlike some of the others. So that might have a shorter half-life than some of the others. And oh, look, it does, because it's cleaved a lot um, by proteolytic cleavage. Um, so we've got some big differences here with these Ig um, subtypes. Um, what else do you notice about um, the Ig subtypes in terms of functions? Can this one do complement? Yeah, IgG4 can't really, but this one can do complement OK. Not quite as good as M, but it can do complement. Can it opsonize? Or bind to the FC receptors of phagocytes. Can it opsonize? <laughs> yes. Um, in fact, it doesn't say this here, but can it um, form antigen antibody complexes? Yup. Um, doesn't really do mast cells. IgE is mast cell specific. Um, but largely, when you think of the functions, IgG can do about all of them. Um, what else stands out in terms of the numbers with IgG? Yeah, Jordan. Pretty high half-life. Half um, what about the levels in serum, especially of G1? We got the highest level in serum, at least for G1. And if you were to add all those together and talk about G as a whole, definitely the highest and definitely has the longest half-life. Um, IgG tends to be made relatively late in the response to some antigen. So here you can see um, our patient receiving a vaccine. They make M, which is shown in blue first. Um, and they make G later. But then at the second um, time that we get that antigen, um, we make tons of G in a secondary response, only a relatively small amount of M. Typically, if we are looking, if your doctor wants to measure if you are making a secondary response to some antigen, they will type you for IgG to that antigen. IgG is usually used to indicate a secondary response. To be truthful, IgE, A, or G could all work for that purpose, but G is present at the highest quantity, so it's the easiest one to look for. So it could be uh, G, A, or E that would work for this, but you have so much more G than any for everything else that G is the one everybody looks for. So usually you can, you'll be typed for IgG if we want to look for a secondary response. IgG is also pretty useful because IgG 
um, is found in the places that are pink in this person, which is kind of like everywhere throughout the blood. But IgG is the only isotype that can cross the placenta. Um, and so newborns are born with a bunch of IgG from their mom. If mom chooses to breastfeed, then mom will also give some IgA. And so at the beginning, our newborn really only has that IgG and IgA from their mom. Um, IgG is able to cross the placenta because it has a specific FC receptor that allows it to cross the placental cell barrier. So there's this uh, FC receptor called FCRN, or it's the neonatal FC receptor, FCR neonate, um, that is able to take um, the FC, uh, the uh, Ig G and pull it across the placental barrier through this insidiotrophoblast, as is shown here, and actually move it directly into fetal circulation from mom circulation through this wall of barrier cells. So this FC receptor is really helpful in moving um, that, and it only binds to IgG. So IgG is the only uh, isotype that can cross the placenta. Um, and so, in fact, before birth, our infants are only going to have IgG that's coming from mom. They may have a little bit of IgA during breastfeeding, and they themselves will only start making things like IgM and IgG a little bit later. You can see kind of the IgM is sort of really starting to pick up around three months. You can see the G is sort of six, nine months um, picking up there. This is super important for a lot of reasons. Um, so first of all, I want you to notice the maternal IgG here decreases quite a bit after birth. The reasoning here is very important. Mom is transferring antibodies, these proteins, across the placenta. Mom is not transferring B cells, actual cells that make antibodies. We're just transferring the antibody proteins. Antibody proteins, like all proteins, have a half-life. And eventually, these proteins are going to be degraded. They're not going to stay permanently. And so at the beginning, the baby has a lot of mom's antibodies. Those antibodies are going to go away with time. So one thing that I want to point out here, um, and maybe this is me getting on my soapbox a little early in the semester, but you know how I love my soapbox, um, has to do with uh, childhood vaccine schedules. So sometimes people really don't like it that their babies have to get a whole bunch of vaccines at specific doctor visits, at specific time points. Sometimes those time points are like three, six, or nine months. Well, let's think about this. If we gave a baby a vaccine at birth really early, that baby would still have mom's antibodies present. And those antibodies would get rid of the vaccine before the baby could actually make a response. So if you give the, the vaccine too early, it's useless. Ideally, you want to wait till right when the baby starts to make their own good immune responses. And if it's a, a microbe that's really dangerous in babies, you want to protect them ASAP. And so this knowledge of when exactly these antibody responses are starting to be made in babies was used to describe the pediatric vaccine schedule and used to actually point out, OK, this is where mom's antibodies are gone, baby's making their antibodies. We want to protect them as soon as possible. And so this was actually what was used to put that information together. One particular uh, pathogen that is really, really, really problematic to newborns, it's pretty much lethal to newborns, is pertussis. Um, which is known as whooping cough. Um, and it is caused by a bacteria. And it is, like I said, it's lethal to newborns. You know, two weeks old, you can get pertussis and die. And it's really, really, really bad. Um, and there have been a number of pertussis epidemics um, in newborns recently. You can see a lot of really sad stories that are out there. Because of this, um, the CDC has actually currently changed the um, pertussis vaccine requirement. Um, and so now the pertussis vaccine is being given to all pregnant women with the idea that they can give the antibodies to the baby so that the baby can have 
antibodies against pertussis to protect them through the placenta right when they're born. And we don't have to worry about that gap. Um, so in fact, um, most pregnant women are asked to get a um, uh, pertussis vaccine um, in their third trimester. There's also a lot of discussion of if you have a newborn of only letting people who are up to date with their pertussis vaccine around your newborn. It's called cocooning. Um, it's a whole big thing. Um, one of my friends had a baby and they were like asking me about pertussis vaccines a lot. Um, and in fact, um, they also now really like to give pertussis vaccines to older people, um, which I learned when my mom went in for a um, a doctor's appointment and the doctor said she had to get a pertussis vaccine um, to protect her grandchildren and then I got yelled at. <laughs> so um, there's sort of a lot going on with, the, with that. Um, this passive antibody transfer can also uh, be a negative. Um, in fact, there are some autoimmune diseases that happen um, as a result of antibodies, sometimes, for example, moms can have this autoimmune disease called Graves' disease, which affects their um, thyroid. Um, I don't know that it makes their eyes ginormous like that. <laughs> if mom has an antibody-mediated um, uh, autoimmune disease, those uh, pathologic antibodies can be transferred across the placenta to the baby. The baby will be sick at the beginning. Um, but, and so you can see the baby is sick here at the beginning. However, because we have just transfer of antibodies, as soon as mom's antibodies are degraded, as soon as that half-life of those antibodies are done, the baby's better, the baby's gonna be fine, and will not actually have Graves' disease themselves. Um, so this passive transfer of antibodies has some pros and some cons. So, we have one other issue that I want to discuss. So, antibodies are proteins. Yes? Yes. Where do proteins come from? Where, how in the nucleus, Emilio? Okay, so we're gonna be transcribing them and then translating them. So what did we have at the very beginning? DNA. DNA. So if you're going to have a protein, it should be encoded by a gene, right? You should have some gene in the nucleus that encodes that protein. Okay, sounds good. Everyone buys that. So even back when Landsteiner was starting to do his experiments, people started to do some math. Um, I'm gonna give you sort of some ballpark numbers um, because knowing the exact number, I'm gonna give you ballpark numbers because Landsteiner's number kind of makes sense. I'd rather give you some today's numbers because they make more sense. The problem holds no matter which version of the numbers I give you. So Landsteiner was going through and he was saying, okay, I've found these really diverse antibodies in my animals. And I'm now going to count how many antibodies my animals can make. So they can make antibody to flu epitope number one, flu epitope number two, and streptococcus epitope number one, and they, he could just count up how many different antibody specificities he could find in his um, animals. And he came up with this as an approximate number, 10 to the 16th different antibodies, 10 to the 16th different proteins. So as we all agreed a few minutes ago, proteins are encoded by genes. So then people actually even now have done things like sequence the human genome and count how many genes are in the human genome. And this is the answer. You have about two times 10 to the fourth genes in your genome. And you can make 10 to the 16th different antibody proteins. Anybody see any problems there? <laughs> what? <laughs> Where do they come from? You have, you're making way more antibodies than you have genes in your genome. 
It's like not even close. And you know, you probably need some genes in your genome for something other than antibodies. You might need them for like T cells and like insulin and actin and you know, every other gene you have. Um, so somehow you, you have this ability to get 10 to the 16th different antibodies from a minuscule number of genes. We're going to use a very small number of genes to get to that huge number of proteins. This is why this problem of diversity and how we generate this diverse number of antibodies is going to take us a while and is going to be hard. Um, it's fascinating. It's one of the sort of key discoveries in making modern immunology, um, but it also um, certainly causes some challenges.